So let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Let's talk about Palm Sunday. Why is this day significant and what does this day lead into? Why is it such a, a big deal? Amen? It's a big deal. Thank you for all your amens. Well, at least you can amen out on Facebook Live. I know there's nobody. <laughs> like I said, I remember the first days when we first started church, there was just nobody here, so I had to amen myself. I had to preach to myself, sit down, yell back amen, and come back. You know, when I did the offering, I had to go sit down and give the offering, come back. I actually uh, had a little tape deck standing right behind me, so I sang. I turned the tape deck on with the microphone, you know, like karaoke. I sang. I said, thank you for, to the worship leaders. I shut the uh, cassette deck off and did everything. So, amen. But praise the Lord. Matthew 21, everybody there? All right, let's go ahead and read verse 6. It says, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt. I think, I'm, am I ringing in here? Yes. Yes, our sound engineer is saying yes. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sent him on, and, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread the clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, the city was moved. All the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So one of the things about Palm Sunday is we uh, always put it aside and we think it's just about waving palms and you know all the, the things that goes behind it and making palm crosses, which we made, and they're outside for you. But Palm Sunday is very significant, and I want you to notice that what everybody said at the end of this when Jesus came in and they declared the Hosanna in the highest, they said, who is this? Who is this? And it's interesting that how God has uh, basically gotten us to a point in, in the world right now that people are scratching their heads and saying, okay, what is this? What's going on? Who is this? Is there a really a God behind this? Is there really a God that we can look, look forward to? Is there really a God that can help us out? Because I said this, I think, last week, the government can do all they want. The government can uh, give us suggestions. They can quarantine us. They can try and find vaccines and stuff like that. But there's only one who can help us through this. There's only one who can take us through this. There's only one who can heal us and shield us and protect us from this. There is only one. Amen. It's very specific. And you know, in the book of Hebrews, we look at Jesus going into the temple, uh, excuse me, going into the Holy of Holies. The Bible said he went in once and for all. Once. He did it one time. He did it so good that he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He did such a good job that he said there's no more of the sacrifices. He was the only, the last sacrifice that took care of everything. Amen? There is only one. And if you're watching today, I want to tell you this. There is only one. There's no one else who can help us through this. There's no one else who will get us through this. There's only one. And if you don't know who he is, his name is Jesus. Amen. So let me continue about Palm Sunday. What's the significance of Palm, about Palm Sunday and where does it lead into? Well, the purpose of Palm Sunday was... Uh, if we go back to the Old Testament, why don't we do that? Let's go there now. Exodus chapter 12. I think it's the best place to go. Exodus chapter 12, and let's discuss Passover. Because Palm Sunday leads into Passover. There's a purpose behind it. So Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. Huh? Passover. Exodus chapter 12. Verse 1. Let me, can I say this about Passover? Well, if you didn't see the, the uh, Ten Commandments last night with Moses, Cecil B. DeMille, you watched it for five hours, right? <laughs> Let my people go. Huh? It's recorded. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing about Passover, and I read this the other day, is this is the second time in history that Israel is in quarantine or shut down and locked in their homes during Passover. 
It is the second time in history that every Israeli, Israelite, is locked up in their homes during Passover. The first time was what we're going to read right now in the book of Exodus. The second time is today. That's spiritually significant, I think. All right, let's look at Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, which is today, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for his household, for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him uh, and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's needs, so you shall make your count, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So let's understand the lamb. The lamb has to be a male, right? And the lamb has to be in its first year, and it has to be without blemish. So these are the specific things that, that it's, it's talking about. We know this, that Jesus is the Lamb of God, right? So Passover, everything that God did to the Jews in those days was pointing to Jesus. Remember, they didn't have books back then. They didn't have uh, internet back then. They didn't have anything that we have today. They didn't have DVDs. They didn't have YouTube. They couldn't read something. They couldn't learn from something. So God had to give them physical illustrations of what redemption was about. He had to give them physical illustrations of who Jesus was, of who the Messiah was. When he comes, he says he's going to be a lamb, he's going to be a male, he's going to be without blemish, and he's going to be in his first year. The first year means he is, he's come into his age. A lamb in its first year is is the best lamb chops in the world. That's when the lamb is, is its prime. And Jesus, according to the Old Testament, that a man could not step into his priestly ministry until he was 30 years old. That was the man's prime. And Jesus was 30 years old when he stepped forward to declare who he was, and he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Amazing how God does that, huh? So this whole lamb thing was pointing to Jesus. Remember the Bible says that Jesus was the lamb, right, slain from the foundation of the world. We know from the very beginning that a lamb was coming, and Jesus was that lamb, and a lamb had to be sacrificed. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned, God sacrificed an animal. What do you think an animal was? Probably a lamb. And he took the skins and he covered them. So from the beginning, a sacrifice was necessary to cover man's sins. A sacrifice was necessary to get rid of man's sins. And Jesus was that ultimate sacrifice that not covered our sins, but got rid of all of our sins. We had Bible school last week, and one of the things that we were very specific that we learned was that the sin offering and the trespass offering, right, was mandatory. It wasn't a voluntary, voluntary thing. It was a mandatory thing. God required a sacrifice for sin and for trespasses. He required it. It was mandatory. So God has demanded a sacrifice for our sin. One thing, our sin is for our sin nature, and trespasses was for the sins we commit. So Jesus was that sacrifice. Now watch this. I don't want to get too much into the sacrifices, but I want you to watch the significance here. In verse 5, it says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. So notice what it says here. You're supposed to go take your lamb. This is your lamb that you've raised, you fed. This is your lamb, and you're supposed to take it and bring it into your house for four days. So on that Sunday, right, it was a Sunday, the 10th day, and you're supposed to take it and keep it in your house 
for four days. And for those four days, you are to live with the lamb. You are to examine the lamb. You are to make sure it fits the qualifications for the sacrifice. Now, Jesus rode in on Palm Sunday. He didn't ride in so everybody could wave palms at him and say, hey, Jesus, you're so great. We love you. Thanks for coming. No, he rode in so he can be examined for four days. He came and he exposed himself as the Messiah, as the lamb that was going to be slain. He says, here I am. I've come. This, I'm from your house. And now I'm coming into your place, Jerusalem. I'm coming into your house, and I want you to examine me for four days. I want you to take a really good look at me to make sure I fit the qualifications of the sacrifice. I want you to think about this. God has shut down the entire world, and there's nothing to look at except for him. In the Bible, in Matthew chapter 24, let me digress for one second because this is very relevant. In Matthew chapter 24, when the disciples asked Jesus, tell us about the end times. What will be the sign of your coming? When will all this take place? And as he's going through the list, right, there's going to be pestilences, which is plagues. He says there are going to be, <coughs> excuse me, he says there are plagues coming. <coughs> but these are just Excuse me, birth pains, signs that his return is near. He's very clear. He says there are per pestilences. A pestilence is a plague that, that covers the entire world, a pandemic. He says there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And then as he goes through the list, he says this. He says that the sun and the moon will go dark for a day, for 24 hours. And the reason it says that, because it says the same thing in the book of Joel, it says it this way, because for 24 hours, God is going to shut down the entire world. At the very end, at the end of the tribulation period, he's going to shut down the entire world, and he's going to say this, there's no lights, there's no NBA, MLB, NFL, there's no Broadway, there's no schools, there's no government, there's nothing to help you except me. And he says, now you decide whether I'm the Savior or not. You decide whether I'm God or not. In the book of Revelation chapter 16, thank you, sir. May God bless you abundantly. Overflowed. <clears throat> you never lack for water. In Revelation 16, it says this, that after all the plagues, God looked at man, and man, all they did was blaspheme God and say, God, how could you do this to us? How come you let this happen to us? And then it says this, but man did not repent. Man would not repent because of the stubbornness of his heart. Guess what, folks? God has shut down the world for a time such as this, and he's asking you this, who is Jesus to you? Examine him. Listen, you've been locked up for three weeks. Open your Bible. Take a look at Jesus. Is he the one? I'm, test, I'm telling you, just test him. Just look at him. Is he the Lamb of God? Or is, is some other cow or a pig or, or a tree, is that your God? Is the government your God? Is Jesus God or not? God is demanding an answer today. You choose, but you better choose wisely. You need to examine him. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible says this, that while they were doing communion, he said this. He said, let every man examine himself before he took communion. So my message this morning is real simple. It is time for you to examine yourself. It is time for you to really think, has God been the first in your life? You have nothing else. 
you've been quarantined. And let me tell you this. If you want this quarantine to continue, then don't choose him. The quicker people choose God, the quicker people repent, the quicker this quarantine will be over and the plague will go. You see, God allows these things to get our attention. He's screaming really loud right now. And he's saying, guys, hey, you put everything else before me. Don't you think it's time for me to be number one in your life? God is a jealous God. It says it. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. Do you remember? I think it was in, in, jo I think it was in Jonah or somewhere in there. They, no, it wasn't in Jonah. It was, it was somewhere in the Old Testament that they built a, uh, a, a statue of a god. And every morning they would come in and the statue would be on the ground. Does anybody know that story? Huh? Was it Baal? I forget, but every time they would come in the morning, the statue would be on the ground. They would rebuild it, put him back together, and the next morning he'd be on the ground again. And God would say, okay, who is your God? Is it a statue or is it the living God? So wherever your life is at this morning, it's time for you to examine yourself. Just And listen, this is a blessing that God has given us time to examine ourselves. Because the next time he does this, it's tribulation time, and you're not going to escape it. This could be over quickly. We'll get through this, but God is causing us to examine ourselves. This is grace. I said this, I think, last week, but when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden, he didn't do it because he was mad at them. He did it to protect them because he says really clear he says, he says, let's put angels and guard the way because if they go back and touch it and eat from the tree of life, they'll be dead forever. He says, then there's no redemption for them. So he says, kick them out of the garden. Otherwise, they'll be in, their, in that state forever. So he did it to protect us because he loves us. Listen, this plague is here because God loves us and he's given us time to repent. Thank you for all your amens. I know there are different uh, uh, philosophies or theologies out there or doctrines out there that this did not come from God and this and that. Listen, I don't know of any other time when, God, when the whole world was shut down. Period. God did allow this. God is going to use this. This is a time for us to sit down and really think of what life is about. Is it about those brand new cars or brand new homes or status symbols? Or is it about him? Interesting. You know, you go to heaven, right? And, you know, you, you get all your bling and your gold and this and that. And then, you know, God says, you know, God says, gold. He says, I, I make streets out of gold. He says, what, what, what's, the, what's up with gold? Why do you guys cherish gold so much when I walk on it? That's what my streets are made out of. And so we idolize gold, right? Everything we wear is gold, gold this, and God says it's pavement. <laughs> Let's continue. Watch this. It says, so your lamb, verse 6, he says, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Jesus died at twilight. He died between 3 and 6 o'clock when it went dark for three hours. Think about this. God shut down the lights in the world for three hours when Jesus hung on the cross. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was dark for three hours. It was a spiritual darkness. And for three hours, the Bible says, he screamed it out. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you turn your back on me? Even Jesus knew this had to happen, but even Jesus knew this was the worst thing in the world. God turning his back on you is the worst thing you will ever experience in your life. Give your life to Jesus. Examine yourself. I'm asking you this. Today is Palm Sunday. The lamb has walked into your house. And the next four days, examine him. 
Look at him. Think about him. Think about what's in your heart right now and that hole that's in your heart. I'm not just talking to people who don't know God. I'm talking to Christians, too, who have backslidden, who have walked away from church and God. The Bible says this in Revelation. He says, he says, you're either hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. You need to make a choice. You need to decide what side, whose side you're on. Verse 7, it says, Then you shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Ready? Verse 8 means this. Not only does he want to come into your house, right? The lambs going to come into your house for four days. But he says, then you need to eat it. In other words, Jesus needs to become part of your life. You know what they say, you are what you eat? If you had a donut this morning, it became part of you. You are what you eat. If you eat Jesus, he becomes part of your life. In other words, Jesus says, he said, God is saying this in the book of Exodus, all those years ago, pointing to when Jesus came, he says, Jesus is going to come into your, he's going to come right into your house. You need to examine him and decide where you're at. And if you're ready, you need to accept him into your life. You need to make him part of your life. And here it says, by eating the lamb. And he says, eat it all. In other words, you can't be a part-time Christian. You need to eat it all. The Bible says, if my word abides in you, we're supposed to abide in him. We're supposed to dwell in him. He's got to be part of our lives. It is no longer time to be a wishy-washy Christian. It's really time to step forward and declare your faith. Be bold about your faith. Have confidence in who you are. Hey, don't you know that people were martyred? Christians were slaughtered because they wouldn't bow their knee and give up their faith. I don't want to stand before Paul and say, Paul, sorry, I, I, I just couldn't do what you did. Think about 2,000 years ago, how many people were slaughtered, Christians, through the years because of their faiths, just so we can have church today. Watch this. He says, and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Here's where I want to get to in my message. Here is where I hope you stick with me just for a few more minutes. Number one, Jesus is going to walk into your living room today. He's walking into your house today. Number two, you need to take a good look at him. Number three, you need to make a choice. Is he, is he the Savior? Is he God or not? And receive him into your life. But number four, it says this. You're supposed to eat it with bitter herbs. You know what it means to have bitter herbs? It means repentance. It means repenting is going to be a bitter taste in your mouth. It means when it comes down to it, it's time to declare, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Repentance is vital to being a Christian. And let me tell you this. I believe when the government and the people begin to repent, this plague will leave. How much longer do you want to be tormented with this plague? How much longer do we need to be in quarantine? How much longer does the world have to be shut down till God gets our attention? It's time to repent, people. I know it's, it's, it's eating humble pie, right? When you say, yeah, you know what, I'm sorry. Come on. All it is is, I'm, is really checking your heart, examining yourself, and saying, you know what, I messed up. I have trespassed. You see, there's two things in this world that we need to deal with. Number one is our sin nature. The Bible says that we're all born in sin. 
every one of us, right? For we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If you're born into this world, you have Adam's sin in your life. It's part of your nature. And the Bible says that Jesus came to do away with that nature. He is the last Adam. And if you receive him, that sin nature is gone. But the second thing is the trespass. You sin every single day. 1 John 1, 9 says that if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you of unrighteousness. When Jesus walked into uh, the, to, to John the Baptist in the River Jordan, he said this, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin, singular, of the world. Sin, not sins, sin. Jesus came to take away our sin nature. That hole in your heart that you're feeling right now. That hole in your heart for not having Jesus in your life. He says, I come to take away that sin. But moving forward, you need to repent because you commit sins. So here's what I want to do. I want all of us to sit for a minute. You know we have moment of silence, right, for people who have passed away. I want to take a moment of silence. And I want everybody to examine their hearts right now. Everybody in here, everybody out there. This is serious stuff. This is a turning point right now. This is pivotal for us to turn the corner. I'm not saying that, that COVID will leave to, tonight. I'm saying that your life will change right now. Your life will never be the same right this moment if you take a minute to think about Jesus. So everybody just bow your heads for a minute. It's a moment of silence. Father, as we've come this morning, taken a moment, we've taken a moment to examine your Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, I for myself have examined your Son. I've examined him fully in his sacrifice, in his life. And I confess, Jesus Christ is my Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, Lord. I examine myself and I know the things that I have done. And I take this moment to confess my sins. Lord, forgive me. I ask everybody in, on Facebook in this room to take the same time and ask for forgiveness. I don't care who you are, we all sin. Father, forgive us. As we eat the bitter herbs this morning of our own frailty, of our own 